this is an image. Um, uh, you've been given lots and lots of text. I'm not going to read PowerPoint slides at you. Death by PowerPoint. Was it all power corrupts and PowerPoint corrupts absolutely and all that kind of stuff. Um, my colleague, Graham Kramer, uh, I was the policy lead for self-management and health literacy in government until I was seconded in the summer. And my uh, immediate colleague, Graham Kramer, is a GP who um, uh, is the clinical lead for self-management and health literacy. And it was he and I that became very enamored of this model I'm going to tell you about um, called the House of Care. I should say, what am I doing here? Why am I at this conference? Long-term conditions, isn't that different? And um, in speaking with people in Scottish government, particularly around recommendation 15, um, of the mental health strategy, we realized that the model that we were adopting was really helpful for them too. So Karen Adams and um, Shannon McIntosh from that kind of strand of work said, please come and speak at the Connecting the Connectors conference, which I did a few weeks ago, and to then to come and say the same thing here, to offer a kind of a, a something that provides a bit of a coherent image. I'd ask you to try and remember one or two of these images, particularly the house itself. Um, Graham. Kramer says, if you're diagnosed with a long-term condition or if your daughter, I, I was hugely moved by the talks today and I'm going to shamelessly refer to, particularly to Graham's um, first talk uh, as, as a kind of a, a way of joining, joining things up. Um, Graham says, being diagnosed with a long-term condition is like being dumped here um, and told you're going to live there for the rest of your life. And uh, where are you going to find food? What happens when it gets dark? Do the insects bite? Do the, are the natives friendly? Do they speak English? Where am I going to find shelter? How does my life look from here on in? And um, yes. So um, this is one really helpful image that was drawn at a World Cafe event where, unlike here, you could draw on the tablecloth and somebody drew this. And the little green line, I don't know how well you can read it at the back, the green line says, the person living their life with a long-term condition. Their life goes up and down. And from a services perspective, from the perspective of primary care, from GPs, from many others, you have these regular um, uh, episodic consultations. And really, the house of care is about the red lines and how they can support people to best effect in living on the green line. So um, yeah, and it's a tiny bit of the time it's only three out of three hours out of eight hundred eight thousand blah 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 it's a tiny percentage of a year that you're actually in touch if you've got diabetes for example um, with uh, healthcare and there's an awful lot going on so from my perspective you've got um, mental health strategy people have powered health and well-being I'll not read it out there's lots going on and I'm sure if I asked you to recite any of the other slides that have been put up with lots of bullet points you won't remember them but remember this there's so much going on, and it makes your headache. Here's commitment 15, you know it, and commitment 28, again, you know it. And I tripped across this onto the internet as a really helpful um, image saying, we've got convergent evolution, we've got stuff to do with mental health, stuff to do with self-directed support, stuff to do with personalization, person-centered services. Um, and then all the mental health stuff. And actually, we are saying many of the same things using slightly different language in siloed ways. It's really confusing. And uh, people lose sight of their contribution to the bigger picture and how it relates to other people's contributions. And I think that's an opportunity missed. We don't realize we're on the same page as our colleagues um, who are dealing with slightly different things. Uh, so yes, that's a penguin, an ichthyosaur, and a dolphin, if you can't read from the back. Uh, so we've got a, a mammal, a dinosaur, dinosaur and, uh, and, uh, and a bird. So useful touchstones. In, in, when I became the policy lead for self-management, I discovered there's some really helpful touchstones. You would have similar different ones, I suspect. These are mine, and the last will be the House of Care. First was a King's Fund report on self-management, where you can see it. Um, enabling someone to be to self-manage could be enabling to take them, get them to take their medications in the way you describe. You use motiv motivational interviewing and particular evidence-based interventions to make sure that people do what they're told. Is that right? As opposed to a fundamental change in the patient-caregiver relationship, a fundamental change. And uh, I was really struck in Graham's talk by 
his description of one of the CPNs. Graham, where are you? Are you still here? He's gone. He was brilliant. Um, he, his description of the second CPN who uh, had a good relationship with him, who, and that relationship was key. And, and it was more like an argument, was it, he said? Um, now, this, I think they, they called it this so that Sassanachs like me would struggle to pronounce it in Glasgow. <laughs> I'll not try. Could somebody? No. Um, yeah, the, the, this is the self management strategy written in 2008 by um, the long term conditions community and then adopted by government. So, policy written by the community, adopted by government. That was its unique thing. And um, it's the partnership with the individual is central to the self-management agenda. It's a really helpful idea. Although Graham uh, and the Alliance, where I now am based, um, uh, say, use the shorthand, people in the driving seat of their care. Now, this is particularly difficult, I suspect, and interesting, because it may be people and their carers, people and those around them, where people's um, capacities are diminished. But I'm here to learn as well as to speak. Okay, the house. The house is a nice simple image and it's got two pillars at the side, a bit in the middle, a roof and a foundation. <coughs> and in Scotland we put a salt tire on, on the roof. It just seemed absolutely the right thing to do. And um, it's about keeping the bit in the middle dry. So it's a clever graphic just to, you know, so it's nothing more at one, at one level than a clever, clever graphic. And people have used it and co-opted it in different ways which may not be true to its ethos because at the centre, it's about um, a, a values-based change. Um, does anybody know the chronic care model? Put your hand up if you do know this model. Almost no one. Oh, thank you. Hey. Um, this is a, a, a dominant model in Greater Glasgow and Clyde, for example. It, it informs their chronic disease management um, uh, approach, and it's well accepted, and it's completely unmemorable. Um, the bit at the bottom, it says productive interactions. And in the house of care, that becomes um, the middle. So um, this just disaggregates the chronic care model, which in some audiences has cogency and then, and then re redraws it. Um, so, but if I, uh, uh, this is a picture I'd love you to remember and just absorb, and I'll just talk about it for a minute, which says that um, for a care, support, and planning conversation, it's not a plan. It's a conversation, it's a dialogue, it's a human interaction in the middle. Um, so it's, it's as Graham uh, Watt was saying, you know, that, that is that um, flexible, dynamic, changeable, adaptive um, conversation. That's what's at the middle of the house. And what can you do to preserve that uh, and make that possible? Number one, you need the right hand wall. Health and care professional team committed to partnership working. Um, I was very struck by the stress. Um, that was sort of referenced with regards to primary care and others under huge pressure at the moment in, in being well enough to support people or being fit enough. Actually, it's quite hard to enable and support somebody to be well if you yourself uh, are not able to do those things. And left hand wall is an engaged, informed, empowered individuals and carers. And that means that people uh, for example, get information, particular example, get information in advance of consultation. But then you've got the foundation, and whether it's walking on the beach with your uh, new love, um, or uh, um, being put, um, uh, going to a walking group in a green space with others ag again, that's the foundation. The more than medicine, informal and informal sources of support and care sustained by the responsive allocation of resources. But all of that is good for nothing, will not happen unless you have a roof to keep it dry. If the financial arrangements, the QOF, the Quality Outcomes Framework for GPs or whatever, limits you um, from having space to have those sorts of conversation, it's not going to happen. So that's, that's the, s the simplicity of the house. So Graham was talking about the Lynx Worker Program. That's about the foundation, linking people into the right-hand wall and enabling people to engage with services. Um, we've heard about other services, which you could just map onto this, and really that was what Shona and Karen found very helpful, that in this, with many of these disparate bits of work, you can map them onto this and say, ah, that's where it fits in the bigger picture. In Glasgow, clinical lead for diabetes went to a meeting 
a steering group for the adoption of the House of Care uh, in Glasgow, where they're looking at diabetes and coronary heart disease, not mental health. Um, but not just, you know, we've already heard about multiple morbidity and depression being a very significant. He, a consultant diabetologist, was arguing for the importance of the foundation. This enables people to see the relevance and importance of other bits of the house, as, as we've heard bits of today, which is hugely helpful. Um, the heart of the house is care and support planning conversation. It's a dialogue, as I've said. It's that human conversation. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'll not go to an example, not enough time. You can put other things in that house. It's about, um, uh, it's not about the biomedical. One of the bits I didn't show from the, uh, I didn't highlight in the um, chronic care model was the fact that huge attention has gone on the biomedical. And that there is a huge value and importance particularly, uh, you know, for diabetes, it's not about the value of the conversation. Well, it is, but it's also about having insulin. And I suspect exactly as the same, the same is true for um, uh, uh, people with um, enduring and um, severe mental health problems f for their drugs. Their drugs are vital. It's not, not about the biological, but it is about the whole person. It is about the physical being a critical part of... Uh, your well-being and your capacity to manage your condition. And these are some other examples, um, so shared decision-making, talking points from other bits of government which are like the ichthyosaur and, and, the, and the penguin. You kind of, you don't spot them and you realize, ah, we are on the same page. We are talking about the same stuff. If you ask people to say what is necessary to support the, for example, the right-hand wall, the health and care professional team committed to partnership working, people say the right consultation skills, education and self-management, education and physical activity for people newly diagnosed with um, uh, severe and enduring mental health issues, uh, clinical expertise, multidisciplinary team leadership, particularly clinical leadership right from the start. Across the foundation, you've got to map your assets. You need to make those assets visible and available within the consultation, and that's where ALICE comes in. A-L-I-S-S, -S, you can Google it. And then you need the individual, in, people joining people with the local assets. It's not just signposting, social prescribing. It may well be chumming someone down the road. One of the problems of the house is it's not explicitly targeted at the issue of inequality, but in practice it has been in Tower Hamlets in London where it made a dramatic shift um, in biomedical measures uh, uh, from 24 to 34% complying with blood pressure, HbA1c, uh, blood sugar, and um, uh, whatever the other one is, cholesterol. Uh, it went from 24 to 34%, which has a knock-on effect for the good things of life, for, for life expectancy. So that's, um, it, it, it was applied in Tower Hamlets. It had that amazing effect. But also, it increased the enablement of people. And again, it's the conversation. I love the phrase from Graham, how you don't get enablement without empathy. And that's empathy is absolutely there, people's stories. Um, Left-hand wall, engaged, informed patients, the sorts of things that are needed are there and across the roof. So um, uh, I don't know that I've got many more slides. I have this one, which is from Isabel Hodkinson, who was the lead GP in Tower Hamlets who said the center of the house is a fragile flower and it's really uh, I think a lovely phrase because in the midst of pressures of quaff uh, the quality outcomes framework the funding mechanisms for GPs or um, time pressures um, the uh, the complexity of engaging with the local resources all these sorts of things put pressure and remove the space for the empathic conversation which is at the center and which is enabling Right, I think, am I, hold on, how am I for time? I don't know. I'm done anyway. I'm done, I'm done. Thank you very much.